Right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our TMTV on, on, on New Build. Um, this is the second event that I've hosted, the first one for a while, actually. Um, but for those of you that, that aren't aware, most of you will be, but TMTV has been, um, has been running now since uh, lockdown. Uh, since it started, where, where we did we did quite a number of them, and since since then, I think we're probably averaging about three or four a month. Um, it's really good and interesting um, debate that we normally have on these sessions. It's a very informal uh, chat that, that 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 we normally try and do. Um, and uh, the interesting thing that we've noticed over the you know since lockdown ended, of course, is that people have got very busy. Uh, so we're seeing an awful lot of people. Um, watching uh, these events afterwards on, on, on YouTube at another point. Um, the only negative for them, of course, is they can't ask questions, whereas, whereas anybody who's attending now, of course, can ask questions and we will endeavour to, we will endeavour to answer them. So, um, so please do use the chat function um, and we will we'll certainly get, we'll certainly try and get round to answering any questions as we go along. Um, Today's session, as I mentioned, is on new build, and I'm delighted to have a have a, 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 a great panel with me to discuss new build and, and what's going to happen, particularly in light of uh, the government's white paper, uh, which has been published recently as well. So, um, joining me to discuss, and I will ask them. I'll, I'll, I'll mention them all by name, and then I'll go to each one of them in turn and ask them to sort of give a 15 second uh, uh, introduction or, or something like that before we get into the before we get into some of the questions. But joining me on the panel, I'm, I'm delighted to say that we've got uh, Tim Taylor, um, a partner from the Foot Anstey uh, Law Firm, uh, focusing on, on on planning and and, and, and policy. Um, we've got uh, Dominic Woodard, um, who's uh, attended some of our events previously and, and is and is actually the pole face of being a developer and developing properties, uh, particularly in Yorkshire. Um, Alan Willen from Glen. Uh, Glenigan, um, obviously uh, planning data specialists, and um, he he should hopefully be able to set the scene for us in terms of in terms of what's going on. Um, and Lord Matthew Taylor, um, who I know many of you will have, uh, if, if if you've not heard speak before, you'll you'll be aware of in terms of the roles that he's carried out in in a number of different governments and his sort of um, specialist subject, if I can call it, Lord Taylor, your 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 approach to. Um, what you think would be the right approach for sort of planning in, in the future in, in the UK. So I'm really excited to have uh, the four of you uh, with me today. So um, if, I can, if I can go to you, Tim, first, um, if you just want to give us a, a few more words in terms of, in terms of yourself, and then yeah. I'll go to, uh, to Dominic, Alan, and, and, and Lord Taylor. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, so as Joe said, my name's Tim Taylor, partner, head of planning law at Foot Anstey. Uh, we're a top 50 law firm. Um, my experience is over many years acting for um, developers, uh, major house builders, landowners, lands and estates, and depending on who's paying my bill, individuals objecting to all those things. Um, so I like to think I see it from both sides. <laughs> Yeah, Dominic Excellent. Woodward, uh, Trico Developments. We're a small developer in the north of England, primarily uh, specialising in Western North Yorkshire. Um, we do schemes as, as, as few as a handful, up to um, 60, 70 units, uh, typically um, commercial through residential conversions. We get involved in, but we do new build as well. Hello, I'm uh, Alan Mullane. I'm the Economics Director at Glenigan. Uh, Glenigan is a construction data company. As, as Joe was saying, we we effectively track all of the um, projects that are coming through the, the planning process, um, but we also look at a, a much wider range of projects than that as well, looking at projects that are coming up as you say through the conversion process that Dominic referred to, and some of those obviously are permitted development type schemes and a whole range of other projects. Um, and we effectively track project, uh, projects from, from cradle to grave, from, from sort of pre-planning uh, through the planning process on, onto site and, and through to completion. Um, tracking that information in, in terms of um, project by project basis to provide information for our subscribers on, on the opportunities that offers to them. Um, but from my, my perspective as the economist, it allows me to look back and actually look at the, across the market uh, and see what the trends are and, what, and try and understand what's driving uh, different uh, trends within the market. And uh, my name is Matthew Taylor. I, I've worked with successive governments since 2008 in developing planning policy. So uh, a review I did in two, published in 2008, looking at countryside led uh, to neighbourhood planning and in part to the MPPF. I then 
uh, led the coalition, the creation of the uh, plain practice guidance that sits behind the MPPF, uh, and then for the uh, Conservative government actually uh, developed the Garden Village and Town uh, programme policy idea. But I spend most of my time working on actual projects, uh, always uh, reasonably large scale mixed uh, use communities. Uh, they may be new communities, standalone new communities, they may be edge of urban, they may be urban regeneration, but they have in common uh, high environmental and sustainability and economic uh, impact standards. Well, th thank you very much to thank you very much to you all. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to start with a bit of a scene setter, as I alluded to. Um, Alan, um, perhaps if I could, it, I could ask you a couple of questions and, and, and maybe you sort of tie them into one. But um, first would be, um, you know, can you give us an overview of what we've been seeing in the new build market over the last few years? Um, and a, a, a wider question, which I think we'll probably come back to a few times, uh, over the course of the next uh, 45 minutes or so um, in relation to how do we define success uh, in this in this area we're often quoting the government sort of 300 uh, thousand new, new new properties but um, um, and, and, and of course we've, we've not we're close to achieving those um, uh, thus far so I mean if that's a success criteria we haven't succeeded um, so far but 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 whether or not there are any other sort of criteria we should be looking at when we're, we're trying to work out what success in this space means. Okay, yeah, certainly. I mean, certainly if you look back um, over the last few years, um, or Taylor referred to the MPPF, and that seems to have been um, something of a, a catalyst for improving overall supply. Um, following that, um, that new guidance, we saw a progressive rise in uh, detailed planning consents for about about five years. Now that seemed to to level off in our data about a year ago. Uh, 2017, I think, 2018 was probably a, a high point in terms of private approvals. Um, and I think I think the factors are really that are driving out. I think it's a question of actually supply and demand. I think the supply, there's a lot of progress has been made to improve supply. I mean, obviously, there may be further pro progress that can be made, and we've got the government white paper coming out at the moment but certainly supply has improved and I think at the moment what we're seeing actually is um, particularly sort of realizable demand particularly on the private sector side of things is what, what's holding things back um, there's obviously been a tightening in the in the mortgage mortgage rules sort of the camp um, dampen things down from a, a, a purchaser perspective um, but then there's a wider economic picture uh, that we saw coming in last year a lot of uncertainty ahead of um, particularly in the second half of last year uh, as we approached sort of the Brexit deadline. Uh, all of that seemed to have a, a direct impact in terms of new housing activity in terms of projects starting on site. And then obviously this year, just as perhaps things we may have just in the first couple of months been looked like they were starting to, to improve again. Obviously we had, saw uh, the impact of uh, the pandemic. Um, and that's something that's hit, and, hit the wider housing market. We saw effectively a a closure of the, the housing market during the second quarter of last year um, and obviously had a direct impact on on new housing house building activity a lot of in fact interestingly the, the private housing sector was probably one of the worst affected sectors in terms of uh, the temporary closure of existing sites and i think that's something to do with the nature of the the construction process involved in uh, in completing homes um, but obviously that also fed through into new projects starting on site um, they, they fell away the sharpest and they've been the slowest uh, to return, return perhaps in, during recover compared with other parts of construction uh, during the third quarter of this year. Um, and I think where developers are going back onto site, they initially they were focusing on those sites which were nearest completion, um, really to try and work around the sort of the COVID rules so they could make sure that it was a safe working that was going on there and re reduced, reducing man, but also, uh, manpower on site um temporarily uh as the new rules were sort of being being established um but but also and i think there was a, a, a financial focus on that in terms of can we complete and, and release these um these properties uh into to the market um actually if you look at the current market now though we're seeing currently seeing a bit of a rebound going on in the general housing market uh property transactions have bounced back uh during the third quarter uh, mortgage approvals during august were up on uh where they were a year ago i mean obviously after from a very low base they have bounced back 
Um, and then yesterday we saw the Halifax reporting that house price inflation had jumped to 7.6% in, I think it was in the, the three months to September. Um, now I think that is current spike current spike in house prices is going to be it's being driven by a couple of factors and, and I think it's going to be relatively short-lived um, certainly we've got the general rebound in new house sales but I think another factor as a direct result of the uh, pandemic has been there's been a shift in buyer interest away from um, the major major conurbations to smaller towns and villages um, and that seems to be being, being driven in, in itself by by two factors one is a, it's perhaps a short-term concern over the impact of an extended lockdown um, and people wanting to have, you know, to try and avoid the restrictions that involves and having a sort of a greener space uh, around them on, on to hand. I think the other factor is actually is, it's going to be a longer term trend um, and that is a change in lifestyle uh, post-COVID uh, with people perhaps looking to do fewer and longer commutes. I think that's going to really try to reshape the housing market Going, going forward over the next next few years, um, and will set new new challenges uh, ahead ahead for us. Um, and I think all of that in the short term is fed into into recorded house price inflation. Um, other parts of the market, perhaps there are fewer transactions, particularly in terms of the uh, the apartments market uh, apartments uh, market, where um, there's potential issues of uh, liability and indemnity um, sort of a uh, in relating to the sort of um, cladding and that sort of thing following the, the Grenfell um, uh, situation. And I think that that is, is, is impacting a lot of potential uh, sellers and, and um, occupants of, of, of existing premises. Um, so I think there's a, that's got implications going forward. So looking ahead, um, I think it's actually going to be demand in the near, over the next couple of years rather than supply that's going to be holding back the, the housing market. Um, better, greater supply may be required in the longer term, but I think it's the demand side that's the, going to be the issue. We're looking at general weakening in the housing market uh, during 2021 on, on account of rising unemployment, weakened economic growth, and, and also the re potential withdrawal of the, the temporary stamp duty uh, relaxation that we've, we're currently, uh, we've currently helped to, to boost demand. Um, so there are generally ex expectations in the market of a actual price, house price falls next year, which again, which is likely to have a uh, uh, dampening impact on turnover in the, in the wider housing market. Uh, and that's obviously got implications in the short term for private housing development activity too. So housing volumes are expected to, um, to recover over the next two years. But I think we're looking at a sort of a, a, steady, a steady recovery rather than a, a very rapid bounce back. I, mean, I don't know if that helps to, to sort of set the scene there, uh, Joe. Yeah, no, I absolutely very much appreciate that. I mean, it's interesting your, your, your point about um, uh, demand, um, um, you know, reducing uh, mm. to a point that supply is no longer an issue, because obviously, certainly for most of my adult life, it's been the lack of supply that's been the biggest challenge in, 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 in the market. But mm. does that then play into, you know, what I was alluding to in the second part of the question about what, 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 what defines success? Because... Um, if we do hit 300,000 uh, units, does that mean that, that, that we're almost in danger of oversupply? I, I think I'm saying that. I think it's, it's well, I, I think effectively, I mean, it's, it's affordable. It's effectively, it's making sure that people can buy homes affordably. Um, and if you can do that, you, you know, and enough people can do that, then the, the 300,000 is achievable. Certainly, in terms of the aspiration for more, you know households to have have homes that's there it's just the that's not being able to translate into demand in the market because of mortgage availability incomes or a whole range of other other issues that perhaps don't directly relate to the direct supply of of housing it comes down to the price of, of homes effectively uh, in relation to to earnings okay so thank you for that alan and, and really good, good picture in terms of what's been going on in the okay. market over the last year, um, if I can turn to um, to to probably to to Tim first, um, when you look back over the last couple of years, what what, what do you think the um, what do you think the successes have been, um, and 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 how's that weighed up with the challenges that that, that are faced? And I'm sure that after you've spoken for Dominic, we'll, we'll certainly be able to provide some colour in, in both of those areas as well. 
Yeah, I, I, it's, it's an interesting question, Joe. I, I think it really depends how you define success. And sorry to give a sort of very legal answer to that to that question. Um, but success, let me just write. I am a lawyer. No, I, I, yes, absolutely. Um, so, so if you define success as flexibility, the ability to get more planning um, permissions for houses, um, then obviously the changes to the PD regime over the past few years has allowed more residential development to come forward. Uh, and Dominic will, will talk to that point. Um, but you also need to balance that against um, quality. Um, you need to balance that against affordability. Um, and you also need to balance it uh, against are those um, schemes actually coming forward? Are they being delivered? Um, so I think success is, is, a, is a very difficult term um, to actually use to define where we are. Um, it really depends where your standpoint is. Uh, from the point of view of local communities, um, any development is often a bad development, um, unless it meets environmental concerns or what the community requires. Um, I think if you, if you take it at a macro level, um, as, as Alan was saying, um, there was a greater number of planning permissions over the last two or three years than we have achieved over the last 10, but still way, way short of anything close to 300,000. I mean, it is, you know, an, an extraordinary figure to hope for, and that's year on year. And every year, of course, you don't make it, um, the, the, the deficit increases. Um, so I, I think success, in my view, um, probably quite limited. Um, I think real success comes from balancing the, the number of houses we need with the quality um, without the adverse environmental impact. And I think success is still waiting for us in the future. I don't think we can say we have achieved success over the past few years. Um, I think if we had, there wouldn't be a comprehensive white paper trying to rewrite the planning system. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so, so, so Dominic, in, from your perspective, um, have, have you seen uh, greater flexibility over the last couple of years and is it is it becoming easier? I don't think a lot has happened in the last uh, couple of years um, however in the last few months really the, obviously the white papers is trying to change that drastically and um, some quite exciting things in there um, you know going forward so I agree with what's already been said about, said about looking forward I think these changes are going to make more of a more of a, an impact really um, I think where obviously there's a big push at the moment for um, you know against development and all this sort of thing, um, but I think most people are bothered about the lack of affordable development coming forward rather than just development in general, um, and I think that is a, a big problem that we need to to fix. And at the moment, my opinion for what it's worth, I think it the, the, the fix fixing is going to come through mainly housing associations delivering these uh, developments than it is the, the private sector. I mean. The white paper, although it hasn't been confirmed yet, what they're going to announce, you know, in there it was talking about removing affordable provisions uh, for private development, sub 40 or 50, um, you know, dwellings for anything you get permission on. So, you know, that's not going to help with affordable housing. So it's going to fall, fall on the housing associations to, to really deliver these new affordable units. Um, that's not to say that, you know, the proposal in the white paper isn't, isn't a good idea. In a lot of ways, it's a very good idea because there's a lot of sites on the smaller end of the spectrum which just aren't deliverable to the affordable housing and, and landowners aren't willing to sell because they don't feel they're getting enough for them. So it does actually tackle a big problem in that regard. But if anything, that just puts more of a burden on delivering these affordable units to the housing associations and the like. Thanks. I mean, I mean, I mean you've, all, you've all mentioned affordable housing, actually, and I, and I noted a, a report yesterday in the press about the local government association um I, I i think basically saying that, that that was one of the biggest challenges they saw with the white paper was that it was going to have a significant impact on on, on affordable housing so i i, I wonder lord taylor as, as somebody who, who probably knows that white paper better than anybody um you know what what your views are both on how the white paper potentially is going to address some of the challenges that that, that, that we see in the market um, but also whether or not it will it will sort of um, negatively impact on, on, on the volume of affordable housing in the way the local government association I uh, think it will. Uh, well, <clears throat> first of all, I, I mean, I was chair of the National Housing Federation for six years and I rather agree with the view that uh, housing associations play an absolutely critical part in delivering, but let's not forget that housing associations aren't just reliant on Section 106. To do that, uh, the larger ones uh, are increasingly uh, involved in delivering market housing of 
various sorts and cross subsidising and the delivery of affordable. So we're seeing, we've already seen a, an emergence of a, of a new approach. And if you look at, uh, I, you know, I do have concerns about that element of, of the white paper and where it's where it will land in the end uh, remains to be seen. I think there'll be pushback on that, and rightly so. But the bigger picture of uh, the white paper is that what we're trying to do is unlock the delivery of large amounts of land uh, for all sorts of development to take place across all of the 10 years and with a much wider range of deliverers, uh, frankly, with much less ability as uh, a relatively small number of big house builders to control uh, land and therefore control the market. And, and that, you, you asked, you know, is 300,000 a year too much? Well, I mean, the demographics say no. Um, back to 150, 260,000 of that is simply to keep pace with the demographics and the rest is to, is to, kill, uh, to kill the backlog, uh, which has built up and uh, broadly speaking, we've been building about a million homes too few a decade for two or three decades, so there's quite a backlog there and the 300,000 figure comes not from a sort of quick fix it dates all the way back to the to the Barker review and uh, broadly speaking uh, the view was that to keep up with the demographics and backfill about uh, 40 to 50,000 a year was as much as you could do without collapsing prices prices will vary year by year uh, and that if you went faster than that you would have a problem with those already invested in the market mm -hmm. i.e homeowners uh, if you went slower than that, you'd see increasing pricing. So it was broadly speaking, aiming to stabilize uh, prices. And I think that's still right. Uh, where have things changed? Well, first of all, I think we've now uh, seen across the political spectrum a move to accepting that that needs to be done in a way that actually at the time of the Barker Review, it wasn't accepted. Highly controversial. Newspapers like the Telegraph attacking it. You don't see that now with, for example, Garden Village and Town Programme getting the attacks that the Eco Town Programme had. Why? I think fundamentally because the generation of people who own houses used to be only too pleased that their prices were going up, and now they're dead scared that their children are never going to move out. And that change in mindset has been pretty profound, and it's reflected in the politics. And Although different parties will have different variations on how you deliver the numbers, it's, it's extraordinary how much acceptance there is now of that across the spectrum. And one of the reasons is that it's consistently either the highest or the second highest, and certainly in the top three issues in the polling about what affects me and my family, uh, coronavirus aside. Uh, so you've seen it rise up the political spectrum, you've seen a change of attitude, and you see politicians trying to respond to that. And I don't think that's going to change. How would you measure success? Well, I don't think you would measure it by delivering 300,000 little boxes by, com by office conversion. What we need to be doing is creating desirable, attractive, thriving neighborhoods across the 10 years uh, with the facilities that people need uh, and uh, offering effectively 21st century lifestyles. Now, in developing the Garden Village Town Program, uh, what I basically argued is we needed to add to the supply of land, that part of that was going to have to be new supplements, as well as urban renewal and extensions. Uh, we've seen that program rolling out at scale, hundreds of thousands of homes coming into that program, not without its difficulties with the local plan process and the inspectorate. And you can see the white paper seeking to respond to that. So the creation of the growth areas, whether they are in any of those category of large scale development, is attempting to encourage local authorities to take not a five-year supply review or adding a few months by adding an estate on the edge of town. It's encouraging and in fact requiring local authorities to take a long-term view of need. Never mind if year by year the economy moves a little up and down. Where do you want to be in 20 years time is the big question for the local plan. And to put much more of the decision-taking process at that local plan moment through the growth areas and through interestingly and something I strongly believe in incorporating into local plan policy the fundamental policy requirements whilst freeing up a lot of the detailed planning because these are new places effectively so you don't have to worry about neighbourliness while strengthening the role of detail planning where you do need to worry about neighbourliness like whether you raise the height of the house in the street or put a big extension on the back of the or or, 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 or perhaps a little bit bigger scheme, but where it impacts existing communities 
more directly. So you've got these two effectively parallel planning processes, one lighter touch, but encouraging larger scale schemes, opening up the market to more to deliver, but being very clear about the essential qualities of place, whilst on the other hand, maintaining a much more detailed, if you like, bureaucratic system. And God knows I've got plenty of scars from dealing with that myself in practical stuff on the ground, uh, but reserving that to where it's more uh, appropriate and tying that actually into neighborhood planning type uh, processes, uh, I think quite, quite interesting. So you're differentiating that way. And then behind all of this, uh, you see the government's emphasis on quality, all parties talking about that, and that's because you're not going to get the land made available. You might this year, be, it'll be taken away again if people see really poor quality of development taking place. So it's not just that people want better quality, but they demand it, and their way of demanding it is the politicians end up refusing development otherwise, and you get the shortage of supply. And then one last thought. Uh, coronavirus. I've been arguing for a long time that 21st century lifestyles, people want to live in really high quality neighbourhoods with quality private and public space. But the reluctance to make land available has led to increasing densification and schemes, for example, of urban renewal, where you're replacing affordable housing and the demand is, well, you've got to have even more affordable housing and you've got to pay for it with market housing. So you see it's very, very dependent dense but high developments with very little public or private open space and actually way too little in the way of community facilities. I think we can see people uh, voting with their feet. They've experienced coronavirus, the neighbourhoods become important to them, private and public spaces become important and lifestyles become important to them. Many, many people not wanting to go back in the office all the time. Sometimes, yes, but not all the time. Uh, and I think that's going to drive very fast this change in demand that you're seeing in the market out there currently but I've been saying since the review I did in 2007 and 8 this is the direction of travel it's what if you like the professional classes have been buying already who could afford it and unsurprisingly now everybody else is saying they want that too uh, and we are going to have to respond to that. It's a very exciting time for people with large-scale new settlements and urban extensions and uh, renewal because they can do it. It's a pretty extraordinary time for people holding high offices in, in the city centres, which we've already seen the retail dying, we're now seeing the offices dying, and how we redevelop that is going to be one of the profound issues of, I suspect, the next couple of decades. Yeah, I was going to come on to that, um, um, I mean, a bit, but, but before I do that, I mean, there was one point that you made, there was, there was a lot of really good, valuable in there, so I very much appreciate that, but, there, but there, was, there was one point that I was interested in, which was you, you indicated you felt that there was now a level of consensus at the political level that meant that, uh, that you know, that, that, that the sort of planning cycle realistically be extended you know, far beyond a, a, a one parliament was, was, was my reading of what you were saying um, and, and, and of course that's I would, I would call it a very positive thing um, uh, but I mean, is, is, uh, I mean did, did, did I get that correctly because obviously there's, 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 there's other things going on in the world at the moment which is actually you know creating more division rather than consensus but do you think this is an area um, where that consensus exists and it's something that we can rely on? Consensus to a point. So I think there's a consensus that we need to build more. I think actually there's a surprising level of acceptance of that in what you might call the shires. Uh, but that's not to say that they accept that they need to build as much as they probably do need to build. And, uh, you know, whenever I'm talking about a new garden community, I'll see objectors that, and you, you'll always see people who are directly impacted who are going to have great concern. Uh, but you will also see uh, you know, the myth promulgated that this will all be people from somewhere else. And yet we know that 80% uh, of sales will be for pe to people who live within 10 miles of where, where, where the sale take place already. It is the children of the shires that are being priced out of the shires, not, not people from the north moving down and you know there'll be an element of that people move around but that isn't actually the driving force so the the ability to understand if you live in x market town in the southeast that the 
development that needs to take place, whether it's garden, community, or urban extension, you know, that's where I think people should be taking their choices and thinking long term about the evolution of place. But either way, the majority of people who will live there will be the children of the people who are already living there. In fact, we're building, of course, for people in their, well, by and large, in their 20s, and, and if they're for buying, they're going to be in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, so they're already alive. These aren't kind of mythical people. These are, you know, my, my oldest son is 13. I've got a 12-year-old and an 8-year-old. Um, when I, I, I don't particularly want them living at home with me when they're in their 30s, much as I love them. Um, not least because my retirement is predicated on selling this house and having a smaller one. So, <laughs> uh, you know, but, uh, but, but the reality is uh, many, many, many more people, about 750,000 aged 20 to 40, are living in, at home with their parents than were a couple of decades ago. And that's not a reflection of an increase in the demographic group. Uh, they're... They're, 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 uh, sorry, in the, in, in, not an increase in the uh, desire to live at home, because they say they don't want to live at home, their parents say they don't want to live at home. It's because the demographic age group has increased, and if you undersupply the market, the people who can't get into it are the ones without capital, i.e. our children. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I may well take a, a small snippet of this video and post it on my local market town's Facebook, which seems to be full of people complaining about any development that goes but on. interestingly i mean last <laughs> autumn when we were still allowed to meet each other i was asked to address uh i think it was about 15 different local authorities across the southeast who were considering garden communities going and talking to their exec and their councillors about it some uh, well down the track others in the early days of thinking about it but the idea that the Shires are as resistant as they were previously is not true. Of course, they'll have an argument about whether you build in London high rise rather than building as much around the edge and stuff. Those arguments will take place. But the fundamental point that people have moved on from the need to where it is, what the quality is, and, and I still passionately believe that that, that we, the mindset that these pretty frankly substandard housing estates added piecemeal to the edge of existing communities leeching on the existing facilities has reached the end of its life uh, because you only have to look at the traffic congestion caused by the edge of town estates to realize that that's that's not sustainable but also it's not what people want people absolutely describe a community you know my, my child draws a picture of a house with a little garden and and if they and if you said to them what would be around it, they'd have, they'd draw some shops and 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 a doctor's surgery. You know, they, they know they know what a, a, a neighbourhood is like, a community was like. We successfully built those for many, 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 many hundreds of years in different ways. Some of them planned, some of them unplanned. Uh, we just need to go back to basics. All right, brilliant. So, I mean, coming on to, to one of the topics you raised there. I mean, Alan, um, in terms of the the uh, the the fact that people are now moving um, out of as uh, potentially city centres, we're seeing some of that because of coronavirus, and maybe some of that that, that will continue. And, 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 and what is absolutely, you know, we're seeing certainly, um, and I suspect we'll all continue to be, that the, 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 the commercial spaces are going to be um, less valuable in the future, possibly, than they, they, that they have been uh, thus far. Um, do you have a view at the moment what sort of proportion of the new build market today is, uh, you know, uh, brownfield conversion. <laughs> so, so something that was previous, I don't know whether, whether it was commercial or whether it was retail or whatever, and converting it into, um, in, into residential. I think brownfield developments generally, I haven't got the, the I have looked at the figures in the past, but I mean, it certainly is, it's probably, it's probably over half of of land that is, is brownfield land in the wider sense that's, that's developed um but they're not within that obviously you've got the conversion of um uh, existing office and, and commercial space and certainly uh, there are some government statistics that i've looked at in the past and i think it's it running at around twenty thousand units a year were being created through at one point through the permitted uh rights development when they relaxed the rules now clearly the thing with that is it, Sorry, Alan, was that 20,000, you were saying? 20,000 units, yes. 
uh, at one point. It has has come down a little bit over the last uh, last year or so. I guess as, as perhaps uh, some of the the best candidates were converted. Um, now going forward, if there is a um, you know a change in the way we are using our office space and the amount of office space we need. Um, that effectively potentially increases the pool of potential properties that can 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 lend themselves to conversion, and then the question is how how you make those those um, you deliver those changes. And maybe Dominic's got some views on that <laughs> expertise no, on that. No, absolutely. I was going to turn to Dominic, and I mean because I know that you've done this sort of stuff in the past, uh, Dominic. Um, I mean, is 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 the the fact that commercial property prices are going to drop, you know, music to your ears. Um, or are you sort of slightly concerned about the, the, you know, some of the bits that Lord Taylor was talking about, about people maybe not wanting those types of properties as much in the future? I think um, you, you've got to kind of think it from the developer's point of view. So the, the developer isn't proactively searching out, um, you know, buildings which are in use to convert for residential purposes. Um, you know, to, to create housing. The developer is, is typically looking for an opportunity to deliver housing, um, you know, which, which, makes a, which makes a profit for them. So um, I think a lot of the damage that was done in terms of the reputation of commercial to residential conversion has, has been done in the past, really, um, mainly down to the, the legislation, um, which basically didn't have um, anything in there about conditioning minimum sizes of these units that you could produce. So Obviously, what happened um, in, in the past was, I mean, it got a, I think it got announced on the, the first of this month that that's going to change now and they are going to have minimum housing standards for all new uh, prior, prior approval um, and, and, and the rest. Um, but, you know, in, in the past, and there's a lot of these developments, you know, still being done now, they are churning out, you know, rab rabbit hutches, um, you know, very, very small dwellings, which you know, they, they rent well, they will still sell well, um, but it doesn't give a great... Uh, doesn't give a great, you know, thing for the um, for, for, for the for the industry really. It, it, they're not great places to live, but there was the demand. Now, um, I think coronavirus has obviously changed everything, um, and I think it will be the the, the real damage is in, is in your Londons, your Manchester's, your Birmingham's, and, and your Leeds and the rest city centres. Office in particular is it's going to take a real hammering, and I think there's going to be a lot of of these um, the, these office developments that will end up um, changing. Um, I don't think that will happen overnight because ultimately they are the most valuable uh, buildings, pound per square foot and the rest still, but I think the, the pension funds and the rest have been badly affected and will be going forward. So that'll take a bit of time to spill through, but definitely some of these buildings will get repurposed, um, but it won't be happening overnight. We got, we got excited about the, um, the, the prior approval and, and PD changes which came in recently but to be honest when you look at the detail it doesn't act, there aren't that many sites which you which it, it works on probably the most exciting of the um, the prior approval changes is the um, is ZA which basically means you can demolish a redundant um, office building or um, or light industrial unit and replace it with residential now um, if, if you go through that in detail it's pretty much a, a, a new planning application so it, although it's got rid of a lot of, um, a, a, a lot of unknown, you know, what, what you have to produce still has to meet, you know, planning guidelines and the rest, and you end up with better development. So it's a good thing all in all. And I think going forward, now we've got this um, the minimum house sizes and the rest, it can only be a good thing going forward, really, for the, for the sector. In, in, in areas where, you know, so, so outside, you know, if you use York, just outside of Leeds, um, do, do you think it will have uh, an impact on, on, on maybe some of the smaller cities or, or towns? It's going to be interesting to see what happens with the smaller cities. So we, we're based out of Wakefield, which is basically reliant on Leeds because most people commute into Leeds from Wakefield and, and, and vice versa. Um, and, you know, same for your Bradfords and, and, and the rest in the immediate area. Um, Obviously, cities aren't going to go away, but how they operate is going to have to radically change. And I think that I think pretty much everybody will agree the nine to five has probably gone now. But I don't think that full time working from home is, is just going to completely replace it. I think what's going to happen is people are going to go down to more two or three days in the office a week and you know, the rest of the time they're going to be home. 
So that's going to change demand, etc. cetera. Um, and people, there's going to be a big push to the suburbs, I think, rather than, you know, having a town centre flat because you're going to be in work. Well, in a lot of cases, you know, the law firms and whatnot, you know, they're, they're nine till 10 o'clock at night and whatnot. So you having a city centre apartment is very appealing if you're working in that sector. But if that changes and you're working from home all of a sudden, you don't need a city centre flat. So um, the, the, the cities which live off the bigger cities have bigger problems uh, to, to worry about because they, re they rely a lot on retail and retail's obviously been decimated again by coronavirus. So how these cities re-identify themselves is going to be really interesting. And I think it's got to be through becoming entertainment venues um, and, uh, and, and, you know, arts, entertainment, all this sort of stuff. Otherwise, there isn't that much point in going into these smaller towns and cities anymore, um, given, you know, everybody's going online and the rest are just going into the bigger city. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting. And I mean, we, even even at, at TM, you know, we, we, we look at it and I think um, there's, there's, there's probably something like, 15 to 20 percent of our staff that actually have shown that they want to be in the office at nine to five. So, 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 so actually, there is a, there is a proportion of people who do want to be in the office, and 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 some people work more productively. I mean, you know, it's it, it's just a fact that you know, really in team environments, and there are some individuals um, who who who've chosen to do that. But um, um, you know, as we're looking at how we use space going forward, um, we will change the way that we use. I'm, I'm absolutely confident of that. Now, whether or not we get rid of some space, um, I don't know. But I do know that there are other businesses, you know, very close to our offices in Finland, who absolutely categorically will be getting rid of their spaces. Um, so, so I think, you know, it will not only be, um, you know, more stuff becomes available, but also how it's used, um, I think, is going to change from a business perspective. Um, there is a question. There is a question from um, from um, the audience. Before I do that, I, I just want to turn to you quickly, Tim. Um, and, and, and just asking in terms of your, your understanding around commercial residential, I'm sure you will have been exposed um, significantly to this, to, to, to this in the past. Is it, is it something that's, that's been a big part of your um, space up until now? And, and, and are you see, also seeing signs that, um, that, it's, that it's changing and, 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 and whether or not it's potentially even going to be a growth area for, 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 for a period of time at least? Yeah, uh, I mean, in, in terms of how much work I've done it, yes, quite a lot of work. And, and, I, and I echo what Dominic said, it was very light touch, the prior approval um, process. Um, and I think the government missed the trick there. I think they could have made it uh, more, more um, uh, detailed. Um, in terms of going forward, uh, I don't anticipate that uh, developers, and I'm not a developer, but I think developers are going to be wary about wading into the city at the moment. Um, I, I think there is um, there, there are alternatives you see for the for the owners of the office blocks with the new change and the creation of Class E. You don't necessarily have to look to resi. You could look to creches. You could look to shops. You could look to doctor surgeries. There are lots of ways to repurpose, um, which may um, aggregated uh, turn out to be a more attractive uh, opportunity for, as Dominic said, the pension funds or others. So I, I don't necessarily see that there's going to be uh, large scale changes, um, and particularly as the conditions, as, as Dominic said, have now become a bit more stringent. Um, I, I don't see necessarily growth uh, there. I think people are going to be very nervous about what our cities are going to look like. Um, I think they do need to change. I think, I mean, I do a lot of work for uh, music venues, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they have suffered a lot over the years because of residential coming into the area. Um, we need to have this bigger debate about what our city centres look like. Um, are they 24 seven? Um, who do they serve? How do we get there? Um, and whether or not these competing uses can live with each other and work with each other. And that's a bigger debate. And I don't see for myself, offices to resi as, as a necessarily a, a, a key part of that at the moment. Uh, no, that's, that's all, all very sensible because music venues are probably struggling more than anybody else at the moment as well, aren't they? Mm. Um, so we've got a, uh, um, a question here. Um, I'm not sure who it's from, but then again, I'm not I think I'm not supposed to know who it's from. But, um, but it says, um, and I don't know if, if, if other panellists can, can see this, so, so if not, I apologise. Um, it says the, the PM recently said that his plan was to build better, build greener, build quicker. Um, uh, and, and on that last point of building quicker, does the panel think that modular homes can assist uh, in pace and, and ability to configure how we use the space? 
um, given that there's going to be more and working going forward. Um, so I don't know, um, I mean, Dominic, do you want to sort of tackle that one first? I always smile when uh, when modular comes up. It's it's sort of seen as the silver bullet that will you know solve everything. Um, it's definitely a good thing modular coming on more and more. Um, it's got a hell of a long way to go before it becomes the norm um, for a number of reasons. But the main reason being it's typically uneconomical to do in the vast majority of the country um, in terms of you know cost pound per square meter and the rest in terms of what it costs versus traditional build. So it's not going to happen anytime soon on, on, a, on a grand scale. Where the bigger opportunities lie is for it, you know, affordable housing being done by housing associations and the rest. Because you know, if they're doing a development of 60 to 100 um, houses in a, in a more or less standardised way, that pound per square foot um, comes down quite significantly and can become quite viable. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, it was also brought up in that point about building quicker um, modular obviously is great once you're on site for getting the house up quicker and um, the big problem we find overall though is actually getting on site and um, it, it, there's a huge amount of delay between agreeing to purchase a site and actually walking on site part of that is the standard planning process but I think a lot of people don't realize that it's not just getting planning permission you know which on, on paper should be you know three months or so typically it's more like nine to 12 months because your planning will more likely take about six months to get through in a lot of cases. And then you've got pre-commencement conditions and they never get mentioned in my experience by enough people, but that's more or less, you know, another six to 12 months in some cases, getting everything ticked off in order for you to be able to walk on the site and actually implement the planning permission. You haven't got the planning permission implemented until you've got pre-commencement discharge. So the big problem with that is, is basically the planning department being understaffed and not being able to turn the work around quick enough. And that's not their fault. That's a bigger picture about they don't have enough funding, they don't have enough funds on seats uh, and the rest. So it'd be interesting to hear what other people have to, to, to think about that. To be fair. The, I think that, um, I think we're gonna see modern methods of construction increasingly used. There's a huge interest in government about it, frankly, because of the demographics of the people who build conventional houses, i.e. they're getting way too old and they're not being replaced. Um, and uh, actually, we'll have to see what coronavirus impacts around that are, but um, uh, that plus Brexit means that a lot of the people who traditionally built the houses, at least in London or around, uh, either aren't going to be let into the country or are, have left. And actually quite a lot have left during coronavirus because of uh, inability to get employment. But, but fundamentally, that's the interest in MMC. It's not about it being cheaper. It's, it's not even about it being quicker. It's about who the hell's going to build the houses unless we can give them employment effectively in factories where, uh, and in better conditions. But it also allows the delivery of the environmental standards and so on and potentially quicker building. The, the key to it is, it, I think it's most appropriate to, to, to large scale schemes. And um, you, you just mentioned uh, housing associations with 60 or 70 schemes. I tend to be working on a, 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 new, a, a new communities that will range from 1500 up to 10, 15 or 20,000 homes. They'll be delivered by different people, but actually they're a great location for modern mess construction. And if you look at European and other overseas builders who use these techniques commonly, what they've, they haven't entered into the UK because they've not been able to get access to land uh, to do it at scale in the way that they would normally do. And, and part of the new community program is, is precisely to provide the opportunities for people to do this. And it's one of the reasons it's been attractive to government. So I suspect that's where you'll see it first. And certainly on the schemes I've, I'm helping advise, there's enormous interest in it. Yeah, I mean, to echo that, I mean, we've, we've seen sort of increased uh, interest from, from our customers sort of researching, trying to find out with, with sites that are potentially where the modular construction is going to be involved or, or wider, as you say, modern methods of construction. Because I think, I think that's going to be the element of it. It's, uh, modular is a bit of a, an all embracing solution um, and actually I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot more case to, to, to find sort of more off-site solutions for various components of, of, of the building um, particularly 
at the moment, I think this heightened the interest in the sense that you people can have fewer op operators on a site. So they've got to, to try and keep the program to, to deliver. Um, there's a swinging, you know, it's, it's rebalancing things and actually pushing people down that route. And as Lord Taylor says, actually longer term, the issue of, of labor availabilities is not gonna go away anyway. Joe, jo, if, if I could just come back quickly on, on Dominic's point, uh, very, very briefly on, um, on the, uh, local planning authorities. I, I completely echo that, you know, and, and you know that belying my age, but you know, shout out to the local planning authorities because that they, they are uh, not only un underpaid but um, understaffed. Morale is low, and and you know, I, I do have an awful lot of sympathy for them. They qualified as planners. They went to university. They want to plan, and actually, they end up just being processors. Um, and, you know, Dominic, you give an example of pre-commencement conditions, you know, they, they don't want to impose those. Uh, unfortunately, it's because of, um, you know, people like me <laughs> who, 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 will, who will look and interrogate uh, uh, decisions by local planning authorities that they take this very uh, belt and braces approach. And, and, it's, and, and it is about releasing them so they can actually do their job um, that they're qualified to do, and I'm sure very good at. Um, but it, it's, it's a desperate state of affairs at local planning authorities. I completely agree with you. Yeah, so I mean, I, we're, we're, we're going to title this session now, it's all Tim's fault. Um, but, uh, <laughs> That's right, anyway. you got my number. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and I think there's some, 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 some really good points there as well, but only in, in, in regards to the, the length of time when you add all the different parts of the process together. And, and you know, again, we, we at TM focus on the length of time it takes to do a transaction. We think that's way too long, but actually the, the length of time it takes to get planning permission is, uh, you know, knocked that into a into a cocked hat um but also the point about who's going to actually build the houses and whether modular houses are part of the fact that we literally don't have the build in order to be able to do that um, we're, we're running into the last uh five six minutes or so um what i wanted to um ask the panel a couple of couple of sort of final thoughts really um uh, one was um and, and 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 maybe this is a more more of a sort of specific point um that, that dominic might might lead on um but um uh, which, which is around whether or not the sort of incoming changes to the help to buy scheme are, are, are potentially going to have an impact on on, on, on the buy to debt market certainly over the, over the course of the next know, after 18 months um the other one was a more sort of general question which i can ask dominic to, to, to address as well and then i'll maybe go through through uh, through everybody else afterwards and, and we'll get a view on it um which is um, if, if, if there was something that you could uh, change, um, uh, you know, this, uh, out of the process, and the answer can't be everything, um, but you know, if there's something that you can change about the process, one thing you could change about the process, um, what, what do you think would, would, would have the biggest impact on, 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 on making the market you know, more successful uh, going forward? So um, I'd ask you to think about that, and, and Dominic, if, if, before you get to that, if you could sort of um, comment on the, on the, the possible impact of public buy, that would be great. Yeah, well, I think um, help to buy was always going to get extended um, because it, otherwise it was going to cause this this cliff edge, especially for the, the bigger developers who, who, who live off it, really. Um, and there's obviously negative uh, repercussions of that as well because it has become a bit of a, a drug for the bigger developers, the help to buy system. Um, but my opinion's kind of changed in particular with coronavirus and the rest. Um, I think we're in the long in the long run now. We're going to be in a, an environment of next to zero interest rates and very cheap borrowing etc so um, that can pretty much only mean that high leverage um, purchases of properties is, is going to be around and you know combined with first-time buyers struggling to get their first feet on the ladder and the rest you know 95 percent mortgages for but for properties is, is just has to be pretty much the way to go and um, as, as we know you know first time buyers, the biggest barrier to them is getting that deposit to go to buy something. Now, it's a completely separate argument of whether um, houses are still too expensive or whatnot at that 95%, after the 95% borrowing and whatnot. Um, but um, to be fair, the, the new help to buy as well, it's, it, it has just focused on its solely first time buyers. It's got rid of um, it, it's being open for, for existing homeowners who are buying a new build. So. I mean, you can give the government a pat on the back, I guess, for that, because they are just really targeting first-time buyers. Um, but yeah, it's here to stay. I think it, it will keep getting extended, frankly. A bit like the bounce-back loans that got announced the other day. That, that was always going to get kicked into the long grass, and I think 
it's going to be the same with, with help to buy. Thanks, thanks, uh, Dominic. And, and, and in terms of something that you would want to change? I'm oh, sorry. Um, well, can I, can I be greedy and say two things then, very briefly? Um, one would be uh, the planning system in that um, I, I think it does need better staffing. Now, my, one of my solutions to that is actually I'd be happy to pay more for a planning application if I knew it was going to get turned around in the right time, etc. So, you know, a better funded planning system can only be a good thing to get more delivery, quicker turnarounds. And the other big bugbear for me is it's an English thing. It's, it's the conveyancing system is it's absolutely atrocious at the moment, it seems, and that's across the board. Um, you know, having, uh, having something similar to what goes on in Scotland would be ideal for us, um, but I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. So um, I'm gonna say the conveyancing system changing as well and getting better funded to have a better quality of conveyancer in terms of completing some of these transactions. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of the conveyancer, I guess, because obviously we do work with a lot, with an awful lot of conveyancers, and, and 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 obviously we are working with them to try and improve that. I, I, we could do a whole other show on uh, on some of the challenges that the, the, the conveyancers face um, that is that is outside of their control. Um, but but yes, obviously we we're, we're also working with them on, on making sure that the stuff that they can control uh, can be done as effectively as as as, as possible. Um, so I have to, I have to say that, otherwise I have to. Um, <laughs> Tim, um, you, what, what would you, uh, what would you like to change? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's interesting because it's the same sort of question that's asked in the white paper, because the white paper asks, if you had three words, how would you, would you describe the current system? And um, the country's leading planning barrister, Christopher Katkowski, QC, was asked this question, and his three words about the current system are delay, obstruction, and confusion. Um, so, you know, and he knows what he's talking about. My three words would probably be invest in infrastructure. Um, I, I think um, so much development is actually held up because infrastructure is looked at as, as a developer issue. And actually often it's far bigger than that. It needs pooled, pooled infrastructure, it needs capital contributions that sites cannot actually justify, which always go to affordable housing and viability and ends up in myriads of affordable um, housing appraisals and, and the like. Um, I would abolish SIL, that's two words, um, but, but succinct. Um, and I would actually have a, a national infrastructure uh, fund, which I know is being looked at, um, and identify um, how you actually unlock what Lord Taylor's rightfully been talking about, about um, community-led um, garden, garden cities, etc., cetera, um, because that is the way forward. So more money in infrastructure. It's easily done. Um, uh, I've, I've, we've got about two minutes left. So, so Alan, if you could do a minute, and then Lord Taylor, if you could okay. sum up in a minute. That well, well in that case, uh, very quickly, I'd, I'd say yes to, to, to sort of the, the, sort of the garden garden village type, type approach, but I think, uh, and try and locking larger sites, but at the same time, I think actually we've still got to, you know, look, make sure there's a good supply of smaller sites coming forward, um, particularly if you want to increase the overall supply of firms that can deliver those projects, because um, the smaller firms are not going to be involved in those larger schemes. You've got to offer, offer opportunities for them to, to unlock smaller sites, um, but obviously in a sustainable way at the same time. Great, thank you. And, and, and Lord Taylor, you've... you've I'd, I'd, I'd go straight back to a proposition I made a while ago to the department, uh, which is, I said, uh, if you want to really unlock the land supply, which then allows the market to operate in a non-Soviet system, which is the supply and planning system we've got at the moment, effectively, deciding how many homes there'll be and then eking them out. Uh, so you need to unlock a lot more land. And to do that, you need the local plan system to go back to its origins of being the long-term vision of place and unlocking the supply of land to deliver that uh, and remove the, the use of the five-year supply and instead have a delivery test. And I proposed that to government and they loved the idea of the delivery test uh, and, in, and adopted it, but left the five-year supply in place. So you've got both, because the Treasury said, oh, great, we'll, have, we'll add to the system. And that doesn't work, because it puts local authorities in a place where they think they eke out a state-by-state approvals on the edge. Adding a few months or even a few, few years' supply isn't enough, because all that uh, does is get locked up by the house builders, because they need five years to make their shares worth anything. Uh, so you need to have a longer-term vision in place 
unlock the land for that. Interestingly, despite its controversies, the white paper does that. So keep the government to that and, and keep them to the bravery of the 300,000 and saying to local authorities, you need to meet the needs of your children, which is the mantra we should use about housing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we've, we've run out of time right at the end. Very much appreciate it. Um, thank you very much to, to Lord Taylor, Dominic Woodward, uh, Tim Taylor and Alan Willen. So um, on that note, I will say, um, I, I would say goodbye and uh, a, a recording of this will be available very shortly. Um, so uh, please look out for that and please look out for future TM TV sessions starting next week, I think, with the uh, with one on uh, anti-money laundering, uh, dirty money in the property market, I think, is its provocative title. So thank you very, mu uh, thank you very much and um, good afternoon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.